Today I want to talk to you a little bit about core processing. I believed years ago that coconut core was a product that was going to be here to stay. The fact that core has sponge-like features and the ability to be able to compress and decompress, I thought it was a significant feature. Even though that I'm not a grower, I've been around growing operations for uh, most of my life. Living here in a small community, Sims, Alabama, where there's been about 150 growers in the, the county, I've seen growers use peat moss, pine bark, pine shavings, topsoils, and a variety of other things for growing medias. Well, back in the 1990s, I was approached by Ben Pointer. He told me about a new product that was going to be coming in from Sri Lanka. He said it was called Coco Peat. Well, anyway, he told me about a man named Stan Myrna over in, uh, in England. And it's, he had been hired by the uh, British government to go to Sri Lanka to help the locals to be able to develop a growing program. Stan, he owned a, a, a grower supply in Wessex County, England, and he had a good background in the industry. What Stan realized was that it was too costly to take peat moss from up north and take it all the way down to Sri Lanka. So what he started doing is looking for a local growing media. To his surprise, he found an abundance of a byproduct called coco pith. Well, anyway, the fibers of the coconuts used for a lot of things. They make uh, rope out of it, mattress stuffing, upholstery. Even uh, They even used it in the part of the backing and Volkswagen seats. But the vision that hand Stan had at that time was soon realized the potential for this core pith. He tried to make a market for it here in America, but the larger companies, they went direct and they cut him out after he had brought it to their attention and after he had educated them on the product. But with the help of the labs and the test facilities, Stan knew that core was going to be a successful growing media if it could arrive at the marketplace at a reasonable price. But the problem of shipping it in bulk was going to be too much. So Ben invited Stan Myrna to come over from England. And when he did, Ben brought him over to my place and he introduced him to me. And then I got with Stan and I traveled over to uh, Wessex, England to see his facility there. And he had a big mountain of core piled up that he had been bringing in from uh, Sri Lanka. And he had been hydrating it water to get it to come apart. But the problem of it is, is uh, when it's compressed like that and you have cold weather, it has its challenges. So anyway, he had built a machine that compressed core pith into slabs. These slabs was about 24 inches wide and it was about 44 or 45 inches long. And it was anywhere from three to four inches thick. And later he made a press to make it into the small bricks which you see in retail sales uh, today. Well, anyway, these uh, different compression ratios, they was experimented with and even went up to a, a 10 to 1 ratio. Finally, they came up with a suitable ratio, which is about 4 to 1 or 5 to 1, because this is the, the best that proved to have a, a maximum water holding and an oxygen retention, and it helped to achieve the optimum results. But the problem was still there, and that was decompressing the slabs. Well. When Stan came to me, we immediately ruled out a hammer mill because it had done been tried. Already, uh, we already made nursery equipment, greenhouse equipment since 1977. Stan wanted me to design a machine that would decompress the sore, the core, and it would do it in a general way. We did a little experimenting. As I mentioned, we quickly ruled out the hammer mill, any type of crushing of the core fibers we decided against this. But I remember my mother making biscuits. She had a round can about this big. It was about the size of a five gallon can. And she kept a sifter in it and it was full of flour. And she would dip that thing down in there and I would watch it sift and I'd watch those bigger particles become smaller particles as she sifted. It kind of intrigued me. So anyway, I decided to, to look at making something bigger like this to use for, uh, for doing the, the job that Stan wanted to do. 
Anyway, the idea of a core buster was born at that point. So we took the, the spiral agitation that moves a media in a figure eight like this, and we incorporated it with a heavy screen. And we included a hydration bottom auger at the bottom of it with some pipe and holes in it. You can hook water to it so it could uh, be expanding as it was coming out of the machine. Well, the results was uh, really, really good. But if you really take a like a five kilo block, you can take the corners of that block, you can kind of break them off, you can crumble it up. But a question that all the growers have, that all their concern is, is well, does it destroy, destroy the core? Does it mess it up? Well, the answer is no, because this figure eight action that it has, what it does is it moves these blocks against one another. So the blocks are continually rubbing themselves apart until they become round like this, then they get smaller and smaller and smaller until the, uh, they'll actually go through the screen. So the very first core buster machine that we built for, uh, for Stan, he was very pleased with it. He purchased it, he shipped it to Istanbul, Turkey. And the good thing is, is that it would actually decompress the core without using any water, no hammer mill, no knives or anything like this. Really a plus for northern climates because people having to pile this core up and use water to decompress it. And then when it freezes, it just makes a, a nasty mess in the, in the winter months. So no water to decompress the core. Water can actually be added only when the customer uh, desires to be able to, to do so. So we built a core buster and we took it to some of the trade shows. And everybody wanted to know, well, what is it? We said, well, it's a core process machine. So their next question is, is what is core? So we realized that even though core was as good a product as it is, that it, the market just hadn't really developed at that particular time. So it took a while for core to be able to catch on. And I've often wondered why some of the peat moss companies didn't jump on the bandwagon early on instead of taking such a negative attitude about core. But now many are getting core and they're incorporating it in their, uh, in their mixes and their blends and they're getting positive results with it. Now we have a core buster that will automatically process a metric ton of core from a hard block into a fluffy material every 10 to 12 minutes. And also a, a hydration incline auger that can be used for expansion and for stockpiling material into a pile or for feeding into a, a blending line. And with the figure eight design, the machine parts aside, they're slow moving, they're low maintenance. As I mentioned, there are no blades, there are no hammers. It's, we just let the core work against itself and gently rub itself apart. Some people have a hard time wrapping their mind around it. They have a hard time understanding this, how it works, when the blocks can be so hard. Some people say, well, what about bad core? Core that's been compressed too hard for too long. I've been asked that question. Well, we took some that a customer sent us from South Carolina, and we put it in uh, pools of water, and we let it float for a week. And a week later, it was still float. Didn't absorb any water. We took axes, tried to chop them apart. Edgeways, still tried to float them in the water. Couldn't get them apart. So we took a whole ton of this material, we ran it through the core buster, and it wasn't a problem. And yeah, the core, it did hydrate and it was able to, to be used. So we've even de decompressed some small bricks that were compressed 10 to 1. So now with a normal 4 to 1 or a 5 to 1 ratio, a standardly produced uh, 5 kilo core block, a machine is able to process them fast, reliable, and affordable. And as I mentioned, it's a gentle action. So there's no need for a hammer mill turning a thousand or twelve or fourteen hundred RPM that can do significant damage to core fiber. And yes, I still say core is here to stay. If I can help you or if you have any questions about core or core processing, you can give me a call at 251-649-6466 or you can email me at info at ellisproducts.com.